Good morning, this is Glenda Dubé coming to you from Destiny Center in Delta, British Columbia. I'm excited to be with you this morning and I just know that God has got a great word for us. And so I just wanna start out today by just thanking God. Um, I just wanna thank him. Um, you know, Psalm 100 says, thank you as a password into his presence. And so can we just uh, all find just something to thank God for this morning, Father? We just thank you for uh, our health, our wholeness, uh, that we have eyes to see and ears to hear. And thank you that you love us so much and that we can love you and that you're a living God. And we just thank you for your goodness, Father. It just passes before us every day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You know, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And so, you know, I just think of some of the questions in this in this time period, you know, like a lot of people are asking, what are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And with all the chaos that is um, happening in the world, you know, um, there's just a question that we hear a lot, you know, what's gonna happen now? You know, we've, we've had the, the cause and now we're into the effect of the situation. Of this pandemic and we're seeing a lot of chaos and what are we going to do if there's a second wave of this pandemic you know is there going to be you know are we going to all have to you know is there going to be a mandatory vaccine and you know what about the economy what about the stock market what about you know unemployment what about you know finances and and just so many variables and so many ramifications and so many things and you know and then we think of you know all the natural things that are happening around about us you know uh what are we going to do with all the increased you know suicide rates that are happening now and the drugs and the alcohol and and the disasters and and the weather and and, and just the increase of everything that we're seeing right now the volcanoes and the fires and the uh you know different storms, typhoons, the flooding in places that haven't flooded and just landslide, just crazy stuff, extreme. There's extreme stuff going on. And, but you know, when the world, we can look at all this and you know, but the world looks really glim and dark. You know what? God always gives us a plan. And that's what I'm excited about, you know? And so I want us to go and look at Genesis chapter six this morning. And this is when, um, the condition, God just describes the condition of the world in Genesis 6, verse 11 and 12. He says, and this is in Noah's time, and he says, The earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And, you know, we can see, you know, the Bible right then is describing the condition of the earth back in Noah's day. And you know what? It's uh, you're gonna see why we need to start maybe uh, building ourselves an ark. <laughs> it sounds like 2020, doesn't it? And God said to Noah in verse 14, He says, "Make yourself an ark." And you know, the ark was to provide Noah's deliverance from uh, the world, the whole world that was perishing around him. And you know what? He obeyed God. And I think uh, God is saying some of those things to us today in this time, just like he said to Noah, he's saying, you know, build yourself an ark, not an ark made of wood, <laughs> you know, not a boat, but he's talking about uh, an ark in our heart. He's talking about hiding that word of God within our heart. And so your abundance, out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. And and so the, when the word of God that we've hidden in our heart, we'll speak it out of our mouth and that's going to save our life in this hour and so if you've built god's promises of protection and deliverance into your heart and life you can you can live in this crazy earth with all the catastrophes and and still feel safe and secure that's what's a supernatural peace that passes all our understanding and it's being enveloped in god's love and grace and peace in this hour and when we look at Psalm 91, and we looked at Psalm 91 a few weeks ago, but it, you know, God puts it this way in Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And that word abide means to dwell. It means to live there, you know, to live and let that be a lifestyle. And it's a permanent word. Like if you, if you stay in a hotel, you're not abiding there. You're not living there. It's just kind of a temporary situation. Your home is where you abide. 
So make Jesus your home. Jesus talks about abiding in John 15, 10. And he says to abide is to be consistently obedient to the word of God. And so many people don't understand that. They think that um, they can just live, you know, any old way they want. And then when they run into trouble, you know, then they cry out, oh, Jesus, help me, help me, you know, and, and everything is going to be fine. But Proverbs 1, 24 to 26 actually warns us. And uh, it warns that those who don't listen and obey the word of God in good times may find themselves stranded, you know, when hard times come along. And so thank God for his grace and mercy, because it's never too late to call on Jesus. And thank God that uh, you can just be going on your own way. You can still repent and call on him when you get in trouble. But I tell you, you know, if if that's where you're kind of leaving it, your faith is not going to be strong when you do that. And I find when people live according to the world and they don't pay attention to the things of God, you know, when calamity comes, when these kind of times come like we're in right now, um, it's hard for them to take their dependence off the world and put it on God. And so right now in this hour, there's a lot of people that are are full of fear, full of anxiety, full of unrest. Um, and have, um, and I'm talking Christians, you know, because they have really not relied and trusted on God. And so, you know, the first thing we can do is, um, is that uh, the secret behind the secret of trusting God is knowing that we have the Holy Spirit who will not uh, uh, only convict you of, of rightness and, and trusting in the Lord, he's going to help you do that. And I think that, you know, we can't do it on our own. And so we need the Holy Spirit, you know, who knows better than any of us know ourself and he's going to give us exactly what we need in this hour and and cause us to trust him and so um he's so patient and you know it's kind of like when we are growing in our in the in our natural way you know it doesn't just happen overnight it's step by step and and so he wants to um he wants to walk with us holy spirit is our paraclete and he'll walk with us every step of the way if we stumble or fall he's there to pick us up and and you know, trusting in the Lord is a lifelong challenge because around every corner there's there's new things that come our way. And, and uh, you know, if you've gone through some trials, if you've gone through things like, you know, cancer or death of a loved one or, or infirmities or broken relationships or job layoffs, whatever, um, you realize that you never really... Uh, finally arrive it's kind of like our faith it's it's always getting stronger as because life gives us a continual workout you know and I think of this this crisis none of us would have realized that a few months ago that all this would have happened and so now we're in, in this but the the good news is that uh, more often um, the good news is that the more often you see God's love and his hand working in your life is that the easier uh, trusting God becomes and you know when you trust the Lord um, you begin to feel like a weight is lifted off your own shoulders because you're no longer trying to do things the pressure is off of you and it's on God and, and he can handle it believe me amen he is uh, by our side and he just wants us to trust him and invite us and in, him into the situation and when we look back to Psalm 91 and verse 3 and 4, it says, Surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. And he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and your buckler. And I want you to notice that those verses um, don't say the fowler or the devil is going to go away. Okay, and leave you alone. They don't say that, you know, pestilence and trouble is going to disappear. Uh, but they say that God will deliver you from it all. And it's, it's important to really get this because in the days to come, we're going to see the world get darker. And, you know, the reason is that, you know, there is, there's two groups of people on this earth. The people of God, the people in the light, people in the kingdom of God, and the people who live in the, the devil's kingdom of darkness. And the people that live in the darkness have no covenant with God. And so... Um, God has given salvation to the world, but, you know, it's their choice whether or not they receive that free gift. And until they do, they can't enjoy the benefits. And so God word, God's word tells us that we all live together in the world, but we all live very different kinds of lives. And when we look over into Isaiah uh, chapter 3, verse 10 and 11, it says, Say to the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their doings. Woe to the wicked! 
for it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given for him. And so it uh, takes two groups of people living in the same place, in the same earth and in the same city, even the same family. You know, one can um, live well and, and one can be living in chaos and one can be in peace and the other one can be in torment. And that's what's so exciting about being a Christian and living in the kingdom of God is that um, when things look dark and crazy in the world, God has the ability to deliver you. Amen. And that's exciting about our walk with God. And when we look in, in back into uh, Psalm 91 again, into uh, verse um, 7 to 9, it says, And a thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and, and see the reward of the wicked, because you have made the Lord, who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. And God has given us his promises over and over again in his word that you know he can take people right out uh in of the of the worst situations or worst circumstances just like he did with noah and you know the whole world may be going down around but you know he preserved noah because he was obedient and he uh built himself that ark and he stood against many odds people thought he was crazy and so when we um hear the words of doom and gloom and on the news every day and and don't you know i just don't don't receive them into your into your life those those words are not meant uh for us and they're not meant for the church um we've been delivered we've been set free and we've been made the righteousness of god and if sin and unrighteousness and disobedience brings the wrath of god upon the earth just like when noah lived you know we cannot be afraid and you know we don't want to uh fear the coronavirus or the effect with the cause which is the coronavirus and now the effect which is the economic crisis that we've been fed by the the media narrative and you know they've been fed us that the plague is is taking over the earth and and you can feel it in the atmosphere but i want us to look over at mark 11 because it shows us that um there's some things that are operating here in Mark 11, uh, verse 12 to 14. Um, this is when Jesus was speaking to the fig tree. And I'm sure many of you have, have heard this and read this. And um, Jesus was speaking to the fig tree. And the next day when Jesus came past it, it had withered up and died. So when we look at Matthew 11, uh, or Mark 11, uh, 12 to 14, uh, it says, uh, the next day when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry and seeing, a f this is Jesus, and it says, seeing from afar a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps he would find something on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And in response, Jesus said to him, let no one eat from fruit, fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard it. And, you know, the thing is, is that Jesus stops and he starts to teach them about the power that we that they have or we have now uh to go into the unseen realm and mark eleven twenty says they they say that the fig tree dried up from the roots it says now in the morning on verse 20 in the morning as they passed by again when they were on their way back they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots and in verse 22, it says, Jesus said to them, have faith in God. For surely I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say to you, whatever things that you ask when you pray, believe that you receive and you will have them. And so Jesus is saying that he was, he was taking, he was saying, take your prayers and, and speak in faith and take the word of God with, with the prayers and, and have faith behind your words. And if you believe in your heart, what you're saying, it's going to come to pass. You know, your words are going to become that force that go into the invisible realm and affect things. Do you believe that? I know that in my heart and the spiritual realm actually controls the natural realm. You know, at Easter time, we were dealing with the corona, the cause. So, but Pentecost coming up May 31st, we're dealing with the effects now. 
And uh, so between now and May 31st, I really have felt so strong in my heart to um, to truly um, get close with God and, and begin to confess and declare and release our words and our prayers so that the effects of this virus, um, which is, you know, shut down economies around the world, does not become that shutdown for our future. Amen? Because what the enemy wants to do is, is take this, you know, some of these exaggerated uh, statistics and, and um, these deceptive, this deceptive narrative that's been, that, you know, put out there and take political control and, and, you know, try to clamp down on things that, you know, our liberties and our freedoms and, and um, so that things are, are shut down. And, and, you know, our forefathers, you know, shed their blood for the freedom and the, and the liberty for our countries and for North America. And so now as the, as the nations open up again, you know, there's all this concern and fear, you know, about there being this second wave and more deaths and this and that. Um, and, but, you know, the death toll has dropped and it's been recalculated. So the people are, are seeing how, you know, even how mismanaged all this has been and just to create a lot of paranoia too. And so, you know, as kingdom people, we cannot allow any more destruction to come to uh, the future that God in, intends, amen? You know, and so we just have to really uh, believe God that um, when we pray, things are being affected, amen, that, that they, uh, they become a force that go into that invisible realm and affect things. And so, Father, we just thank you now that our words go into the spirit realm, behind the scenes, right, behind the scenes to the roots. You know, Jesus cursed that fig tree and it said it withered up from the roots. It wasn't just the leaves, it went from the roots. So our prayers can go to the root of something and kill it. Amen. And so some of this narrative and some of these things that are being, you know, uh, spoken out there and, and we need to come against those with the word of God and our prayers and go to the root, go to the motive, the very cause and the effect of things. And, and that, um, our, our words can disrupt this narrative that is in the world right now that's causing fear. And I pray, uh, Lord, that you would begin to bring us up out of this, you know, kind of confinement, this oppression that's been tried to put upon us and give us confidence and faith, you know, that the world economy and life is going to be restored again. And, and even now, Lord, as we are praying, I just, I really believe, Lord, that you are moving, you're moving on our behalf. Even when we may not see it, you are moving, you are working. And I pray that we don't become, um, as Christians, um, docile or, or get used to this um, as our new normal, so to speak, because I thank you, Lord, that um, our freedoms are at stake here and that you are not an indifferent bystander. And I thank you, Lord, that you give us boldness. You give us a new... Um, a uh, fire of confidence in our hearts to break forth and see um, that we will not be dictated to or manipulated um, by this, you know, deceptive information that is, you know, man-made and, you know, demonically manipulated from a lot of the news forces right now. And so thank you, Lord. Between now and Pentecost, May 31st, I pray that the, that the body of Christ is... Um, is going to press itself into uh, the position of prevailing in prayer for the shifting and the opening of the Canadian economy again. And, and, you know, Lord, help us to recover from what we have stepped into. And um, we're not going to step into just the celebration of Pentecost. We're going to experience Pentecost. Amen. Now is, is the time to go into, you know, the upper room and and get into the spirit and this shaking has has caused global issues to be uh realigned and reassigned and the future of canada is not guaranteed unless the people of god secure a canada that is going to fulfill god's purposes and so you know like i said our country was founded on god it was founded on freedom and liberty and many men men shed their blood and so we don't take that lightly we don't want to give those things up Amen. We're in that uh, really, uh, we're in a time period right now between the resurrection and the Pentecost. And it's a time when our, our prayers have great effect. And so I just encourage you to uh, let your voice be heard in this hour. Daniel was told when he prayed that the angel came to him. We can look in Daniel chapter 10. You can read that. Um, 
And the angel came to Daniel and, and said, um, Daniel, I broke through because of your words. We have to find the words that God wants. And what is the purpose of, of a great awakening or a revival? You know, souls, you know, they're getting saved. You know, that's a start. You know, that's a great harvest. That's But God is after nations, nations turning to him. God wants to... Um, he, he wants reformation, not just a visitation. He wants, there's some things that are in reform right now. And the harvest is coming in and um, we just, you know, have to come against that antichrist spirit. We have to intercede now for the destiny of our nation. And so, you know, take your prayers, apply them and get your confidence, your boldness. And, and because the nation was founded on God. Amen. For the liberty and freedom. And so we need to stand in the gap for the recovery of Canada. Well, for the recovery of the of a lot of the nations right now. And I just think of also when, when Cornelius was visited by God, when God sent an angel out of heaven to visit his house, the angel said, Cornelius, I'm here because of the prayers you prayed and the words you spoke and the alms you gave. And, you know, it's the giving of God's people too. It's, it's the... Um, it's our anointed words, our prayers, and it's those prayers that literally create uh, an open heaven. It creates that pathway between heaven and earth, heaven. And so our words according, like we just read Mark 11, um, those kind of words, they go into the spirit realm. Jesus was showing us that our words can be powerful and they go into the spirit realm and they affect and um, our giving goes into the spiritual realm and it affects it. And so in this time of, of um, economic uncertainty, when there's people that are suffering and, and uncertain of the, you know, the future, um, you know, we can, we can confess and we can believe and we can plant our giving in the spirit where God uh, goes to work and creates that connection uh, for you in this earth between you and heaven and so Cornelius's prayers his giving and created that pathway and the angel came through that pathway and said uh, God is about to move and he's going to do it with you <laughs> and so you know I always say you know we were born for such a time as this and this is why we are in the kingdom for this hour and in the in the midst of this um, shaking right now you know doors are opening and doors are closing. And so God is positioning you through those open doors if you're willing to go. And so they just, you know, I just wanted to uh, let you see that there is such power in our faith-filled words in this hour. And if we want to start seeing the power of God manifest in our life and in this world, we're going to have to start, you know, paying attention to what we say. You know, words have power and um, more than any of us realize, but we often speak uh, as though they're meaningless and we say silly things because most believers I always say the greatest power we have is right under our nose and that's in our mouth our tongue and Mark 12 36 and 37 says but I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak uh, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment for thy words they shall be justified and by their words they shall be condemned so every idle word, and simply means something that's non-productive. And these words that you speak, but you don't believe. Like, for example, like we might say, oh, I'm just dying to see my grandchildren. You know, but you don't really mean that you're dying. But you say it anyway, just to kind of, you know, emphasize the importance of that. And every time you say things like that, that, you know, you, or this is just killing me or whatever it is, like you don't really mean it. You know, it begins to kind of numb your heart. And unconsciously, you know, every idle word like this is, is making it just a little bit harder to believe what you say actually will come to pass and actually will count and actually uh, has meaning. And so Jesus certainly, under, you know, he totally and completely understood the power of words. And we can see that in Mark 11. When he spoke, something happened and he used them to change natural things around him. And when we look back at that Mark, you know, 11, verse 13 and 14, it says, you know, and seeing from afar, um, he came to it and he found that nothing but leaves, it was not in the season. And then it says, you know, in response, Jesus said, let no one eat fruit from you ever again. And his disciples heard that. And so um, in the morning as they passed by, they saw that that fig tree dried up from the roots and, and Peter um, said, Master, behold, the fig tree, what you cursed, has withered away. 
And, you know, Jesus says to him, you know, well, have faith in God. Because I say, you know, whoever shall say this mountain be removed and cast in the sea and not doubt in his heart. Those things that he says shall come to pass. And, you know, I can almost hear, you know, Peter's voice saying, you know, to Jesus, you know, the fig tree that you cursed Jesus has passed away. And, you know, he was totally in, you know, surprised and, and couldn't believe it, right? And when Jesus answered Peter, you know, I'm sure, you know, he was probably like, well, uh, Peter, uh, did you not believe what I said? You know, and I guess, you know, the Lord was like so amazed at, at Peter's disbelief that he did not believe what he had said. And he said, you know, like, should it shock you that this, you know, the tree is withered? I cursed it. <laughs> you know, have faith in God. And so when he went on to explain that this was not just limited to this little example of a fig tree, he was using a mountain as an example. And, you know, but I believe I could, you could apply it to anything. He was making the point that if we say with our mouth and believe with our heart, we can have what we say. And he made it really clear um, who could use the words this way. He said, whoever shall say. And so... Are we a whosoever, <laughs> you know? Yeah, because you are, and if you're, you know, you, we are qualified as, as Christians, as, as um, born again uh, Christians, that our words can affect the natural and the spiritual realm. And so Jesus used the word um, say in these, uh, or saith three times in verse 23. And he was saying that, um, he was making it clear that the words have power. And he also said to have faith in God. And the words that have power are words that are filled with faith. And it's important to understand um, that the faith that, that we fill our words with is not um, a human faith, but it is um, faith in God. Amen? That God is going to back up what we are saying. And when we look at, um, at Galatians, we can look at Galatians 2.20, and it says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself to me. And when you study this out, it becomes really clear that it's talking about the very faith of God that he placed in us when we were born again. You know, every, uh, you know, you can't even be born again without with your own faith, right? It says, Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by the word. And 1 Peter 1, 23 says that you're born again by the word of God. And so that faith is dropped in our heart by the Lord. And if you can't even believe for salvation um, with our human faith, how can we possibly use it for other things like, you know, healing and deliverance? And so it's super important that you understand this. If you don't know this, you're always going to be looking to other people to pray for you. You're always going to think that you that uh, they have more faith than you have. And because of that, you know, God's going to, you know, only answer their prayers as they pray. And that's wrong. That's wrong thinking. And it's the, it's the reason that a lot of Christians are looking to man instead of God for their answers. But Romans 12, 3 says, For I say... Through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according to God, as God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. And so I think of that measure, it's like when we're making a recipe, especially in baking, it's like your measurements have to be precise. And so you take a one cup measuring cup, and every time you make that recipe, you're measuring the same amounts. And so the recipe is going to turn out the same. And so the Lord, he takes and he gives a measure. He gives the same measure, okay, to every person. It's a perfect measure. It's the perfect ingredient. And he knows the exact amount. And so we have a measure of faith and he has given it equally to everyone. And uh, no believer has more faith than another. It's just that some do a better job of using what they have been given. Amen? And so Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Verse 3 says, Though faith we understand that the words were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And so this, this um, 
scriptures is not symbolic. It's actually, you know, it's talking about God creating everything with his words. And when we go back and look in Genesis, um, at the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, all the way through Genesis chapter 1, we see God's creation, the, the seven days of creation, the six days and God rested on the seventh. But every day when we look through, you can go through chapter 1 and you can underline how many times it says, and then God said, God said, let there be light. God said, let there be a firmament. God said, let the waters, the heaven. God said, let there be lights in the, in the firmament and the heavens and divide the day from the night. And God said, let the waters abound. And it just goes on And everything God spoke into existence. God said, let there be. And guess what? There was. And so the scripture is not symbolic. It's, it's speaking about the fact that things can be spoken into existence and the very substance of the faith of God manifested in what we now see. And so the word of God has unlimited power. It's alive. You need to understand that. It's alive. I always say that to people. Our Bible, the word of God is alive and it's breathing. You know, it's like, you know, um, and it's alive and it's breathing. When we put that word of God in our heart and we begin to speak it out, it's going to affect things. You know, each, each word is like a little um, capsule filled uh, with faith waiting for us to release it in our hearts and speak it with our mouth. Everything we see was created by words and, and it's the very word of God that that holds um, the universe together in Hebrews um, let me just go there for a second in Hebrews uh, 1 verse 3 it says that um, all, who being the brightness of his glory the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So he had, he's upholding everything, okay, that he spoke into in existence by the word of his power. Everything that we see is going to respond to faith-filled words. And so we, um, they have to respond because the word of God is alive. Proverbs 23, 7 says that as you think in your heart, so are you. And Luke 6, 45 says that what you speak comes from the abundance of your heart. And in other words, the way you think, okay, controls the way you talk. And if you understand that your words have power, then you understand how we can get in trouble by this little thing under our nose here the greatest power we have is is right before us right under our nose and the only reason that every one of us you know isn't dead from all these idle words that we've spoken is because we haven't thankfully believed <laughs> everything that <laughs> with our hearts and thank gods that our words have to be mixed with uh, faith and that we have to believe them from our heart but this should keep us um, to see that the powerful truth, if we believe that we're um, going to be sick, or if we believe that we're always going to be poor, and we start confessing that out of our mouth, we're gonna get what we believe. And on the other hand, uh, what happens when we take our faith-filled words of God and start planting them in our heart uh, where they can take root and grow? Everything starts to change. No longer are we just saying, you know, I believe that I'm healed or I am prosperous, but we believe it. And the faith of God is then released through those words. Um, Proverbs 18, 21 says, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit of it. And so it, it not only says that life, but death as well. And it's, you know, it's sad to say, but most of the words being, um, spoken out in this season right now by the news and by a lot of people around by the world are negative words words that don't bring about life because they are focused on the problems and you know most most of what i i like to teach and i talk about are the words that we speak you know you can ask my kids you can ask the ones around me um uh this will you know completely change your attitude about the words that we're speaking out of our mouth if if you will get it in your heart and you will learn that um words can change your life 
now and as well as your future. You know, you are the prophet of your own life. Do you believe that? You're the prophet of your own life. And, and you know, the Bible it really shows us that what you say shows what is inside our heart. And so our words can bless, they can encourage, they can um, show compassion. And, um, and, and we can be grateful with our words. But when others are, you know, are in a crisis situation or in this, you know, we're all in this situation now, um, can others find that comfort and peace in your words? Can you come to them with words of life? Do you, you know, pray for other people? Do your words show that compassion in your heart? Because when we start to move in those kinds of things, we're moving in the very, um, you know, our heart becomes like the Father's heart. And that's what God wants. Amen. And so our words have a lot of power. And the power in the tongue, you know, um, we can speak a lot of words. <laughs> a lot of words, um, you know, several thousand in an hour. <laughs> and you can imagine how many words the average person speaks in a day. And, you know, everyone always makes a joke, oh, well, women speak so much more than men. But um, oh, that could be true in some cases. <laughs> it could be true the other way, too. Um, but, you know, we could fill volumes couldn't we? If everything that we spoke out was recorded, we could fill probably a whole library. But the tongue has a powerful um, influence on other people too. And, and God is looking, he's looking at that. He's looking at a holy life and he's, um, and one, one of those areas is that we really have to guard is what we are speaking out. And the truth is we all have problems with what we say. And that's probably why the Bible says so much about the tongue <laughs> and proverbs is filled with with verses about positive and negative um you know and uh, the turn and when we look up you know you look up tongue lips mouth words like that they appear like like hundreds of times in the bible and you know we boated you know many years and i've shared lots of examples and uh i just remember that uh you know in james 3 4 you know it says how the small uh, the how small the rudder was and it would steer the whole ship you know in the midst of a storm and James 3 4 and 5 says take you know take ships as an example though they are so large and driven by strong winds they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go likewise the tongue is a small part of the body but it makes boasts consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark so speaking negatively is, is costly in the spiritual realm. And so when we speak positive and we speak faith-filled words, we're actually um, going to cause and affect some great things. And I, I think of, you know, in Jericho, God's people marched around the city in, and they didn't say anything for six days. They were required to be quiet. And then when they finally shouted on the seventh day, the walls came down immediately. And so their silence and their shouting at the right time brought them into a place of victory. And it is the same uh, with our lives. It's, it's if we will guard our speech and have wisdom as to when to speak and when not to speak and then um, declare when God wants us to declare, we can, we can really walk into great victories. And, and um, when we walk and speak in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit, we defeat the enemy. We defeat his plans. We defeat his purposes, his strategies. And when we abide and we dwell in that secret place with the Lord, he begins to flow out of our lives. And, and uh, we, what we say and what we do, you know, it's, it's just going to become part of us. And when we um, walk into a place where maybe there is fear in the atmosphere or people are, are stressed out or whatever, we can come in with that spirit of life and that spirit of peace and, and speak words that will change the atmosphere, change people. They will draw life from it. And so our words um, have a lot of power. They really do. And so I wanted to, um, you know, so many, you know, people can, um, you know, Proverbs, they just speak things out and they wonder why they're in a ruin or why they're in a, in a wreck. But, you know, most of, of, of faith has to do um, with what we're, like I say, what we're saying, saying out of our mouth because there's creative power in those words. And, you know, if you want to know where you're going to be in, you know, say five years from now, you know, just start to listen to what you're saying about yourself now because you are creating um, with your words your own future. Proverbs 
18, 20, and 21 says, From the fruit of his mouth a man's stomach is filled. With the harvest from his lips he is satisfied. The tongue has the power of life and death, and those who love it will eat its fruit. And so we do eat our words, and they become our life's harvest. What we allow to come out of our mouth really becomes what we eat in our life. And so, like I said, words are like those seeds that go before us, and we end up planting the future of life or of death. And, you know, many people are, you know, say, you know, I'm never going to get better. I'm never going to get, you know, out of debt or, you know, um, this, this virus is pen, this coronavirus is everywhere. You know, it's flu season, you know, I'll probably get it. Or, you know, my marriage is never going to make it. And, um, you know, or, you know, we went out and, and uh, I heard a woman say, you know, I've just been dying to see you. And, and we say all sorts of these negative, weird things and wonder why, um, you know, weird things happen to us. Because um, people plant into their future uh, defeat and they plant negative things. They plant weird things. And it, and it seems like uh, we never really can figure it out. And, you know, when we get up in the morning, especially if you're going through a tough time, as most people are right now, you need to send your words in the direction of the life that you want to go. And so people say that, you know, this is going to be a lousy day today. You know, I hate my job. You know, my spouse and I are going to fight again. Or, you know, I'm homeschooling my kids. These kids are driving me crazy. Um, you use your words to um, describe and to literally plant your situation. For many of us that love gardening and whatnot, you know, it's a time we've been planting a lot of seeds. We're seeing the growth. Um, but what are you planting in the garden of your life, you know? You used um, every day, you know, we use our words to describe and plant our situations. And so instead, use your words to plant and change your situation, Instead of saying, you know, this, you know, it's going to be a lousy day, say, this is going to be a great day. Thank you, Lord. This is a day that you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Say something about your job that um, is going to, um, Lord, thank you that my job is going to fulfill me today. And I'm excited to go to work. And I'm thankful for a job. And my spouse and I are going to have a great time together. Thank you, Lord, for blessing our marriage. Or my children are the, are the joy of my life. Thank you, Lord, for their health and wholeness. And, you know, you might not feel like saying it, but, you know, either what I've just said here, the, the, of giving a lot of the word of God here, either it's true or not, um, you know, you got to believe that it's true. And instead of using your words to bring bad things, use them to bless, you know, plant blessings, not cursings. You know, and I, I just want to ask you, what have you been planting? What have you been speaking over your family, your marriage, your occupation, your health, your finances? You know, it's not enough to just wish it or think it. We have to give life to it by speaking and, and speak out what you want, uh, which is the, the uh, faith-filled words, you know. And so, you know, for example, you know, your kids may be rebellious, but... Um, and then when you're with other people, you start to share with them how rebellious your kids are. But, you know, Jesus said that there, there's power in agreement. And, you know, um, you can believe, you know, most people probably are going to agree with you that you, maybe your kids are rebellious or whatever. But you've just planted your child's harvest right there. You've just spoken that over your child's future. And you've had other people come in agreement with that now. And instead say, you know, we need to say when we're around people, I thank God for my children. They are blessed. Amen. And that they were going to make good decisions and that they're going to be free from every stronghold and that they're going to fulfill their destiny and be successful and have a great life. And when you start to speak victory over their lives and, and you begin to plant a good future for them. And so be like the Lord and speak um, what isn't as though it is right. The be not speak those be nots as though they are speak those faith filled words because uh, Romans 4, 16 to 17 says, Therefore, the promise comes by faith. The God who gives life to the dead and calls things that are not as though they are. And so the promise comes to pass, comes to pass and faith, including calling those things that are not as though they are. God showed us how to separate faith speaking from faith-filled words. Don't say that I've been you know, hurting and messed up for so long that I'm never going to be better. 
you know, you're, you're defeating your future, you know, make it positive and say, you know, maybe I'm not, you know, a hundred percent, but you know what, I'm on my way and God's working on me and God's restoring my health and, and then my best days are ahead of me. You know, my hashtag in these last couple of years, year and a half has been, you know what, the best is yet to come. And I'm excited about that because we need to plant good things. We need to speak faith filled words. And, um, you know, I just, um, you know, people just say such silly things and confess these, oh, my kids, you know, they'll be in jail one day or, you know, they do this, but what happened? Guess what? They end up in jail. <laughs> and someone said, oh, well, you know, my, my grandpa died of cancer, my dad died of cancer, and, and I guess I'm going to die of cancer, and, and guess what happened? They end up getting cancer. Or, you know, my finances are getting worse and worse, and, I you know, I'm probably going to go bankrupt, and guess what? They probably go bankrupt. Um and uh, I don't know about you, but I'm not going to speak defeat over my life. And I encourage you not to speak defeat over your life. I'm going to speak by faith, by speaking faith-filled words. And you need to pay attention to what you're saying because, and get people to help you. Ask them to tell you if there's anything that you're saying that is negative. Because, um, and don't get upset with them when they say, you know, if you're talking negative. And it's funny, you know, um, I will always say, well, I break that curse. <laughs> if someone's around me and says something that's that's going to curse me or curse something or, or curse themselves, I said, well, I break that curse. I don't come in agreement with that. And it's so funny. I just think of um, one time my son-in-law was on the job site and, and he's in construction. He works with a lot of rough guys. And, and uh, you know, he had just gotten married and, you know, the guys were all teasing him and saying, oh, well, you know, you'll be in a divorce in a year or two, you know, nothing ever lasts, no marriage ever lasts. And, and, uh, and he had been around me so for so long now that he was, he just automatically, what came flinging out of his heart was, I break that curse. And one of the guys like, what did you say? <laughs> and he was like, he mumbled off something else, but um, it was just so funny because he would not allow that curse to land upon someone speaking that over his marriage. And, uh, you know, I was just so proud of him. But, you know, that has to, that's a trained thing that has to that come in our life that we will not accept that to come out of our mouth or allow others, people to, to curse us like that in that same way. And so... Um, you know, people are, you know, oh, I'll probably die soon. You know, I'm going to, you know, die of this or die of that. I'm going to get this disease. I'm going to get this pandemic, you know. Um, but, you know, the thing is, uh, you don't want to speak that over your life. I just speak. I say, thank you, Lord, for the covenant of your blood. The blood of Jesus covers us. And then anything shall pass over. And then we are protected. Amen. I stand in that. And I'm not going to allow... Um, you know, the more we talk about being depressed and oppressed and all this other thing, you know what, guess what? We're going to walk into that and we're going to become that. And uh, I don't want to, I don't want to be like that. Um, I don't want to be like that. You know, Psalm 91, like I just said already, um, Psalm 91, we can go back to that. I, I just encourage you to memorize that Psalm and get it in your heart. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. And, you know, when we're talking about the secret place, not everybody knows about this place. And it says, you know, I will say, this, this, when you look back at chapter one, or verse one and three, it says, I will say, and he will do. And so when we begin to, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge. And then it says, he will deliver. So we have to find that secret place with God that not everyone knows, but as a Christian, you know, you need to find your pathway to the secret place. And then you begin to say of the Lord, begin to speak his word, and then watch him do. He says, I will do, I will deliver. And so I just encourage you to speak victory over your life and to um, see that breakthrough. Um, declare your future with positive, positive seeds coming out of your mouth, not negative seeds. Um, and it just... You know, people say, well, I'm just telling it like it is. I'm just telling it. I was, well, those are the facts. But you know what? I have the truth. And the truth is the word of God. And Joel 3.10 says, it says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. And so in this hour, I encourage you to hold up your sword, which is the word of God. Hold up your sword and begin to wield your sword in this hour. Let the weak say, I am strong. And we're not supposed to talk about, um, you know, weakness and like it is. We're supposed to talk about how it's supposed to be. You know, if God says I'm more than a conqueror, you know, I might not feel uh, like one and I might not look like one, but I'm going to agree with God, not the devil. 
Amen. Hebrews, um, and I'm closing up here. It says Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we possess for he who promised is faithful. So we don't want to swerve in this hour. We don't want to let go of our profession of hope and faith because God is faithful and he is going to go to work on our behalf. His word will not return void. And God says, we will eat the fruit of our words. And, you know, when we look back and I, you know, as I said about Jesus cursing that fig tree, nothing happened right away. But uh, the leaves didn't fall off. The tree didn't just turn to dust and combust right there. But in the unseen realm, the root system was cut off. And it's only a matter of time before um, what happened on the inside showed up on the outside. And later that tree was dead. So when you speak, you might not see anything right away. But in the supernatural realm, something is happening. Even when you don't see that he's working, he's working. He's working on your behalf. He takes your faith. The Lord takes your faith. It's a substance. And he can take those faith-filled words and they will be effective in the spiritual realm. And, you know, people... Um, step out and in faith and begin declaring the things that are not as though they were, but they see that maybe nothing happens. They become discouraged and they just decide that it doesn't work. But, um, and then they eventually just go back to speaking negative again. And you can't, um, talk about talk sickness over yourself and expect to walk in health and you can't talk lack and, and poverty and, and expect to have abundance. You have to put a gag over your mouth. Lord, bring angels as guards at the side of my mouth and don't allow me to speak negative unbelief. And uh, Zechariah says, uh, Zechariah 10, 1, it says, Ask ye of the Lord rain in the time of the latter rain, and so the Lord shall make bright clouds and give them showers of rain to every one grass in the field. Why would the Lord tell people to ask for rain in the time of rain? You know, even when things are going well, don't stop asking for more rain. Use your words to plant those beautiful grassy fields of your future. You are the prophet of your own life. And if you're going to get your words in the right direction, you're going to see uh, obstacles that were in your way, obstacles that were hindering you for years clear out of your path. You know, you're going to see maybe family difficulties that were permanent, you thought were permanent. They can turn around in a heartbeat. Situations at work, you know, in your workplace that you thought were toxic and out of control, they can heal overnight. You know, God can move wrong people out of your life and bring the right people into your life. You know, stop talking about your problem and start beginning to talk to your problem. Take the word of God and speak to your problem. Call those things that be not as though they are. And God's word coming out of your mouth, you're going to see amazing power. It's not enough to, to just think it or believe it. Um, you're going to give it life by speaking out and speaking those faith-filled words. Amen? Well, I just say, Lord, bless you and keep you and may his face shine upon you in this season. I just encourage you to walk in victory, walk in the word, get that word of God in your heart and begin to speak it over your life and you're going to see things turn around in this next season. Amen. God bless you. Bye-bye.